Morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here as well. I'm excited to share the Word of God with you. We're going to read it together and then just reflect on turning points, exactly like Rob said. In fact, have you ever thought about this? Every day has the same 24 hours. And I, I think that's weird to think about. Because not every day is actually equal. On some days, the status quo of our current story is very much maintained. Maybe most days. Wake up, eat, go to school or work or whatever your activity is. Come home, eat again, I guess. Um, scroll Instagram yeah, is, is the thing. Uh, post whatever you think about the world on Facebook. And then, don't forget Bible and prayer. Am I right? Oh, I get you. Is this thing on? No. So the status quo of our life, but on some days, the status quo of our story, if you think about your life as a story, is changed. Some days are turning points. Consider the frequent changes in the lives of young adults, especially adapting to life after high school. These young adults, this is just a week or two ago, this picture, all of us who aren't young adults now have been young adults. So cast your minds back to the frequent changes of young adulthood, adapting to life and moving into adulthood. That's why we call the group Crossroads. It makes sense because that's how life feels. Young adults may see some changes coming, but on milestone days, single days that are great turning points, like graduation, the first day of college, first day in a new job, and so forth, the plots of our stories take dramatic and really unalterable, even no matter what happens next, unalterable turns. It's also true of spiritual turning points. When someone gives their life to Jesus and is baptized, it is the most significant turning point of all. In some respects, the entire book of Acts is one long 28 chapter turning point, describing how the disciples, who once sat around a fire with Jesus listening to stories in Galilee, are now sharing Jesus with the known world. And I'd venture to say that every message in this series so far has been about a crucial pivot in the story of God and the church. Go back at the media page on our website, for example, and see. All the messages are about turning points. This includes the story just before our passage today. If you have a Bible with you, we are in Acts chapter 13. And I'm going to let you in on a couple of the bits of the story just preceding this. For example, last week we heard in the scripture that in Antioch, which is a city north of what we think of as the Holy Land, it's in Syria, in Antioch, that was where the disciples were first called Christians. Clearly a major turning point. Because we are, I, I don't know if you know this, we're still known as Christians. Yeah, you got it. Also while in Antioch, we didn't hear this last week, those newly named Christians initiated their first organized charitable initiative to people suffering from famine. It's in the latter part of that chapter. Organized acts of compassion would become such a significant attribute of the early church that later even the pagan emperor known as Julian the Apostate would explicitly admire Christians for their compassion and call on Roman citizens to act more like Christians. It's a big deal. And this chapter, right before this, is where we f see the first organized effort towards that charity. Also, the false king Herod, famous Herod, he's now died, foreshadowing the disintegration of a broken system. While by contrast, Luke tells us, the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Acts 12, 24. Turning points like these lead to today's passage, one of history's most significant turning points of all. Today... We're going to see Christians turn from being reactive to being proactive. From teaching locally to teaching globally. And from an old identity to a new identity. And we're going to walk through these three distinct elements together by reading a portion. Then I'll pause and we'll discuss and then continue. Like I said, if you have a Bible with you, now's the time. Acts 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, a couple things. One, there's uh, usually a few in the pew racks in front of you, so grab one of those. I actually left mine in my office, so that's what I did. Join me. That's why they're there. Uh, but if you don't have a Bible of your own, a printed Bible in particular, come tell one of us or visit the Welcome Center and we will get you a Bible. Okay, we have some available. 
Also, the Bible is, is conveniently on your phones and devices, okay? Let's listen for the word of God. Acts 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Pause here. And consider the first turning point of this passage. Here Christians turn from being a reactive and improvised group to being a proactive and organized church directed by the Holy Spirit. Looking closely at verses 1 through 3, look for features of this organization of Christians. They've now been called the church several time, times in Acts already. The word in Greek, as I said I was going to mention, is ecclesia. Can you say that? Ecclesia. In Spanish, you'll hear it much clearer. Iglesia is the Spanish word for church. Very much almost the same, right? Ecclesia. Church really means congregation, just like this, or assembly. Never the building, but we know that, right? Yeah, it always means the assembly of believers. Acts, so we already know it's a church. Acts records numerous times as well they did what churches still do. Gather, to worship, to pray, to meditate on the word. This, though, is a turning point. It's the first time in, Lu in Acts when the story tells us they fasted together. Fasting for many reasons, but it is also a common practice when you're trying to discern the will of God so you can do the will of God. So it seems that the assembled believers now have gathered with at least a desire to know what God wants them to do and then with an attitude of going to do it. It is a turning point for the church. No longer merely coping and reacting, just being thrown in jail and hoping the Spirit will release us, right? Not just hearing, hey, go talk to this random guy over in Caesarea and I'll give you instructions from there. That's reaction. It's good. But something's changing. Now the church saying, we're not just going to wait and see, we're going to go and see. You see the difference? Yeah, it's a major, major change in the history of the church. Not just reacting to circumstances, but being people who can help shape circumstances. Expanding the shalom, the peace of the kingdom of God. Speaking of the Olympics, on July 26th this year, the Paris Olympics opening ceremony included performance art, which evoked a reaction from Christians around the world, as it appeared to many to mock Leonardo da Vinci's portrayal of Christ at the Last Supper. In short, Christians around the world reacted to a circumstance we could not change. It had already happened. Agreed? And, hear me on this, that's a good thing. React. It's part of living in this world. Engage. It's not wrong to react. React. Right? Speak your mind. Ask your questions. It's okay. It creates dialogue. It's natural. The question isn't, should we react? The question is, should we only react? Is it enough to post my comment? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. No, it's not enough, actually. Will we only react? Or will we actually realize that an Italian Renaissance painting can never represent Jesus better than you can? You believe that? I hope so. Because this is wonderful. But it, it doesn't hold a shadow to you embracing your neighbor. All right? So what will we do? Just a fun little bit of good news. <clears throat> On August 4th, the Associated Press headline read this. Olympic and faith leaders seek reset after opening ceremony outcry while chaplains welcome athletes. In a shared hall near the athletes' village, religious leaders in Paris made space for over 10,500 Olympians and staff to pray and to worship and to speak with chaplains and so forth. 
Now, it was an interreligious effort, which is its own opportunity, but the point is there were priests and pastors there. There were people leaning into the fact that God loves them and wants to engage with them, despite whatever we had reacted to on the opening ceremonies. That is an act of proactivity, saying we're going to reach out now, not in anger about a thing, but because it's true. God loves you, and we're here to show you that. Is that not encouraging? I find that deeply encouraging. It doesn't mean the reaction was wrong. It just means the pro-action was right. Last I checked, we don't have any leaders from the International Olympic Committee here in University Place. So what are, you, what are we going to do about it, right? But every single Christ follower hearing me right now, live or later in, re- in recording, we know we can be proactive in sharing the peace of God in Christ within our own circumstances. UP is not that big of a city, for example. Read the city newsletter. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct how you should pray for the city, where you should be involved, not just watching things unfold and reacting. And if your sphere of influence is smaller than you would like, get creative. Write letters to your children, grandchildren. Invite a neighbor for coffee. Take a risk and ask someone in person how you might pray for them. It's easy. You just say, how might I pray for you? And when you do pray for them, follow up and see how they're doing. Be proactive. And of course, you can always invite a friend to church where the two of you together can come and explore what God is doing in your lives. It's a joyful time. The question is, will we listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings like the church in Antioch did? And then when we listen, will we actually have a yes attitude when the Spirit prompts us to move? It is fertile soil now, as it was then, for people to have new experiences of of God's power and God's love. It is, you can write this down, it is an exciting time to be a Christian. Thankfully, our early brothers and sisters in Christ obeyed the direction of the Spirit at this turning point, ordaining Saul and Barnabas, and just as a footnote, in exactly the same way we ordain people today. Exactly the same way, right? So we follow them in that. Ordaining Saul and Barnabas and sending them off to be proactive with the good news. But where would they go? Let's pick up where we left off, Acts 13, verse 4. The two of them, Saul and Barnabas, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, which is a port, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, I'm going to show you a map in a moment. They proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. We're going to pause there, even though it's the middle of the verse. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, Be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so the church obeyed. As Christians now turn, second turning point, from keeping Jesus locally to sharing Jesus globally. This turn from local to global is specifically here the turn from a primarily Jewish audience to a non-Jewish audience. It's not the first time Cornelius, for example, we've heard about, famously, right? But primarily non-Jewish and intentionally non-Jewish. The Jewish background is clear. Jesus was Jewish. He gathered a following of Jewish disciples. He did his earthly ministry mostly in and sometimes adjacent to Jewish territory. Even in Acts 2, where the Spirit inspired people to speak multiple languages. Very global, right? But it happened in Jerusalem. Right? It happened amongst Jews and Jewish sympathizers. So even that was still pretty local. Take a look at this map. It helps us see the physical turning point at Antioch. Antioch on the mainland, there's Seleucia the port. And the green line is the route out to Cyprus. The apostles now taking a sharp turn westward away from their previous north-south route on the mainland. They were in decidedly new territory here. But even there, Saul and Barnabas walked that red line, about 90 miles of the island, to teach, quote, in Jewish synagogues. Even there. So the turn really happens when they get to the west end of the island, the town of Paphos. Specifically, non-Jewish Gentile, Roman, pagan, all these words to mean new territory. The entire Roman Empire was steeped in mythology. Paphos, it turns out, 
and this nearby bay, this bay itself, was believed to be the place where a familiar goddess emerged from the waters. Anybody know the name of the goddess who emerged from the waters? Aphrodite, yeah, the goddess of love. Her Roman name, though, Venus. And her legacy lives on in the 1968 song Venus by Dutch pop rock band The Shocking Blue, <laughs> covered in 1986 by girl group Bananarama. Quote, I'm your Venus. I'm your fire at your desire. And now you can join me in having that song in your head for a full week, like I've had it in my head. <laughs> the point is that much like late 60s Dutch rock and roll, they were in odd territory. Okay? Saul and Barnabas were displaced from their own home. Now, the, now they weren't welcoming strangers like the Torah says to do. They were the strangers. This whole new thing, whole new paradigm. They were strangers amongst people who presumably knew little to nothing of their history, their culture, their scripture. They had no privilege here. We often refer to this as conscientious displacement. When we choose to be strangers somewhere else. It's not only good for the mind, it's good for the soul. Some call it getting comfortable being uncomfortable. And I would submit that it is an essential ingredient in the for spiritual formation of a follower of Jesus. In fact, not only I, we as your pastors and we as a session insist that you as the congregation and the ones who hold the mission always consider and be ready to be conscientiously displaced for a time so that you can broaden your view of what God is doing and have a healthy perspective on your role in it. We have trips to the U.S. South and the Holy Land to learn their histories and learn how God is at work there. China as well. This February, we have an opportunity to work side by side with brothers and sisters to bless their community in Mexico. Don't speak Spanish? Never swung a hammer? Go anyway. It'll be uncomfortable. But get comfortable being uncomfortable. There's a lot of opportunities right here at home. You've been putting off Alpha. We've been offering it for five years. Get uncomfortable and bring a friend to Alpha. You've been putting off Rooted. You know how small groups work. If you're not into it, you don't need another one. Get uncomfortable. Get comfortable being uncomfortable and bring a friend with you to Rooted. Jump into volunteering, back to school fair, lunch distributions. Check out the cross cultural fellowship that you keep hearing about and haven't gone to. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. At the very least, come and meet the pastors, which is uncomfortable for some people, at a little event that we call Meet the Pastors. If you haven't been in new territory lately, it's okay. It's okay. No guilt, no shame. But great opportunity. And if you haven't been in new territory lately in your life, in terms of the church especially, it probably isn't because God is keeping secrets from you. Have you thought about that? I don't know. I just don't know what God wants for me to do. Is that because God's like, tss, 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 I'm not going to tell her? Or is it possible that we actually haven't made time to listen? Make time to listen in scripture, prayer, and circumstance. Notice, and when you feel the Spirit say, go there, try it. Go there and see what happens. It is an exciting time to be a Christian. In the new territory of Paphos, Saul and his team find themselves with their most powerful audience yet, the Roman governor Sergius Paulus, a coincidental name. Let's finish our reading, in, uh, starting back again in verse 6. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, same person, that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit, and trickery. 
Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is more in this final passage than I can cover in this last little moment of of the teaching today. But I believe Luke wants our attention on this particular turning point. That Christians are now turning from an old identity to their new identity. Take a look at Raphael's painting of the event we just read about. This was painted centuries and centuries later, of course. Uh, But it's cool. Paul on the left, in the kind of rust-colored robe. Uh, Sergius Pontus, the governor, in the middle. And then you can see Elemus groping about on the right side of the image. Elemus, also oddly known as Bar Jesus, which is Aramaic for son of Jesus. Luke presents him as a dramatically ironic alternative to both the Lord Jesus, clearly, and Saul's renaming of him here literally as a son of the devil. So ironic. Regardless of his name, he's a Jewish man who submits to a Gentile authority, mistake number one in their eyes, and who is clearly lapsed from Jewish law, which condemns so-called magic or sorcery, and, and it condemns it a lot. Okay. By the way, if the magic and sorcery thing evokes questions in you, it does in me as well, ask Rob. <laughs> we'll talk about it sometime. Let's do a class called Sorcery and see how many people, I'll sign up. Elemus' sorcery is, is sensational, but I don't think it's Luke's point of focus. Neither is the moment of his blinding. It's dramatic and it's ironic too because the human agent of his blinding was Saul, who himself had been blinded for the same reason, his own sin. A little bit of irony here that Luke is playing with in the telling of this story, right? Making sure we don't miss it. But I don't think that's still the central point of this story. The whole scene begins and ends where Luke wants us to focus. That is with Sergius Paulus, the Roman governor. He's the one who initiates the meeting in the first place. What does this represent, this moment, for Christian identity and purpose? The scene with this man might remind you of another time that Jesus was presented to a Roman governor. That governor's name, Pontius Pilate. Pilate was in the actual real presence of Jesus himself, and yet he did not believe. What would happen now as mere representatives of Jesus found themselves in a very similar situation? Surely if they didn't, if Jesus didn't bring what it takes, these guys can't. That's what the early listeners would think. I think we all know where the story is going to go. Imagine if you'd never heard it. It can be hard to picture ourselves in settings like this uh, because we can focus on the sensational things like miracles. We might think something like, well, I don't know how to blind evil people, so I'm not sure if God can use me. And that's fine. But again, that's not really the point. And look at the verse. It's not actually what changes the governor. Look at verse 12. This is the best. When the proconsul saw what had happened, that is the blinding of Elemas, He believed, for he was amazed at what? The teaching. It wasn't actually the supernatural, at least the act, that amazed him, according to Luke. It was the teaching which was perhaps punctuated by the miracle. (laughs) But I'd love to see a look on his face. Yeah, wow, blind. Huh, weird. Anyway, tell me more about Jesus again. Right? the, The miracle's fine. But it's not the point. Remember, Jesus performed miracles, and most people didn't believe. Miracles don't convince. They demonstrate. What convinces is the teaching and the experience of the people of God and of the Holy Spirit, of course. So what does this mean about the turning point in our identity? The conversion of Sergius Paulus 
is massive. It's one of those things where even as I read this, even all these years studying Bible, that I'm like, this should be like a major, I should have this in my head the way I have the woman at the well in my head. I should have the conversion of surgery. So mark it in that Bible that you definitely own and bring with you to church. What does this conversion tell us about who we are? Well, looking back at our two turning points so far as we, as we come to a conclusion, early Christians have turned from being reactive to proactive. Saul doesn't just react to Elemas. Oh, no. He, he's proactive. He does something. The early Christians have turned from being local to being global. Saul and his team now being strangers in a strange land so more people can be blessed by the good news. Sergius Paulus and Elemas, by the way, also blessed to know the truth. Right? So what turning point are we seeing here in our identity? We see Christians turning from an old identity to a new identity. What is it? Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And he was speaking into a particular situation. But the truth of that new identity applies broadly. So broadly, I don't think I can specify in one moment all the facets and expressions of what that new identity is for you. It's something we explore for the rest of our lives. But in today's passage alone, we see it in several ways. It's the change from identifying primarily as sinners to identifying primarily as saved. The change from follower to leader. From learner to teacher. From listener to doer. Even from feeling powerless to being empowered by the Holy Spirit. These changes are never really either or, we know that. We must always remember that we're sinful, that we're followers of Jesus, learners of his word, listeners to the Holy Spirit, and powerless without him. We know that. But our identity can shift, it must shift, into knowing that we are also saved, and leaders, and teachers, and doers, and given power by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that today? Do you live your life knowing that that's true of you if you bear the name of Jesus Christ in your life? The Bible says it's true. Do you know it's true? Do you live that it's true? Do you feel that it's true? The church in Antioch realized they were at a turning point, not just in terms of what to do, but in terms of who they were. Crucified with Christ, as Paul puts it. They had realized that what they were called to do was based on who they now were. For the Christian, Christ is our identity. In the case of Saul, the turning point's punctuated by Luke no longer referring to him by his Hebrew name, Saul. And for the rest of Acts, emphasizing his mission to the world by only using his Roman name, Paul. This is where we see that change. In this sensational account of the church's first mission, The task they were commissioned to do is exactly the same as the task you and I are commissioned to do today. To proactively bear witness. To proactively bear witness in new areas. And to live into a new identity that is all that Jesus is. For you, for me, and for us as an assembled church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and the ways that it encourages us and challenges us. For the ways it continues to unfold and open up new meaning through the years of study, it's a living word because you are the living God. I ask that you would, now with all this, all this talking, crystallize in everyone's individual minds and hearts what it all means for them. Speak, Holy Spirit. We are listening. And we say yes to where you would send us. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.